Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Last Sunday was the end of daylight savings time, and anyone with young children knows you're about back on schedule today. Maybe, maybe another week or so and we'll be back on schedule with bedtimes and whatnot. That shift of hour, that shift of when it's daylight, it, it, it does definitely mess with our sleeping patterns. Now, I'm not a fan of darkness at 5 o'clock, but I'm also not a fan of waking up in the morning when it's pitch black out either. For some reason, when you wake up and it's dark, it's really, for me at least, disorienting. What is the first thing that you typically do? You reach for the light. You reach for something to, to, to let your body know that it is time to be awake. It is time to wake up for the day. If you've ever been woken up suddenly at night, that I'm sure has been your reaction. Where, where's the light? What is going on? I want to be able to see what is going on around me. Today, I want to talk a little bit about light and the light that was talked about in our parable and some of the things that are going on with that reading in Matthew 25. So let's jump into this text a little bit and try to unpack what's going on here. As we are in the end of the church year, it, it turns, oftentimes thematically, it turns to this return of Christ, which the church has been looking forward to for 2,000 years. And even in the time Jesus walked on earth, he taught about that day, and we have another parable that speaks to those very things. Matthew 25, 1 through 2, hear these verses read again. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Jesus begins this parable with some familiar words when he says the kingdom of heaven is like or the kingdom of God is like. And then he goes on to describe it oftentimes in a parable. This reign and rule, this ushering in of God and his authority in both heaven and on earth comes into picture when we, when we get these words from Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is like. And this is pointing to the fact that he is going to return, that he is going to come back. And the focus of this text is will people be ready? Will people be ready when Jesus returns? The focus of this text is about the preparation that was taken by those who went out to meet the bridegroom. The focus of this text is not um, sometimes what is made of it. Rather, it is will people be prepared? The distinction between the two groups are not those who like in some parables that we've read recently, we had those people who didn't want to go to the wedding feast, who didn't want to have anything to do with what the king was doing. And so the king then went out and gathered up people to bring into the wedding feast. Here we have ten people, ten virgins, who want to go to the wedding feast, who want to greet the bridegroom. And the difference is not whether they desired to be with the bridegroom, it is whether or not they were prepared. Five had oil and five did not. The text calls these ones with oil wise and these ones without oil fools. It is about preparation or the lack thereof that distinguishes these two groups between one another. Not their desire to see the bridegroom, rather will they be prepared? Will they have oil for their lamps to burn? Now the natural question when wrestling with this, with this parable is, so what does the oil represent? What is it that this oil represents? And then let me get some of that, right? Well, I think the text leaves it somewhat ambiguous intentionally. 
because the point is not what is the oil. The point of the parable as a whole is be prepared. Be prepared. So what must the Christian do to be prepared? The wise were prepared and they entered into the wedding feast, while the foolish were unprepared and were not allowed into the wedding feast. Because when the trumpet sounds, preparing is over. When the trumpet sounds, there is no more time to prepare. So what is going on here? What do we have here to prepare for the bridegroom? That is the question that we must wrestle with. What is it that we have as oil that will burn our lamps when the uh, bridegroom returns? So what is it? What is that oil? Is it faith? I think at its very foundation, faith is part of what that oil is representing. Do we have faith in the one that is coming? Do we trust in his work rather than our own? Do we have faith in him? But I think it's even more than that. It is, will we be diligent with that faith in the here and now? You see, preparation is kind of a hard thing for people to do. We don't like to have to prepare. We don't like to have to put forward effort, put forward work, when we may not need all of the work that we put forward. You've probably heard the, the, the story of the, the grasshopper and the ant, right? Where the ant is working diligently, diligently working, and, and, the, and the grasshopper is off bouncing or frolicking around, and in some versions even openly mocks the ant for its preparation, for its work to be prepared for what is coming. Well, the scriptures have its, have its own kind of version of this story or allude to uh, the same idea. In Proverbs 6, 6 through 8, it says this, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in harvest. You see this picture of the one who prepares and the one who doesn't. The scriptures refer to the one who doesn't as a sluggard. And the ant is to be emulated, working diligently day in and day out in preparation for that which is to come. Why don't we like to prepare? We don't like to prepare because it's a lot of work. It's hard. It's it's putting forth effort into areas that we may not actually ever need. Isn't that preparation in and of itself? We don't prepare for that which we simply know is coming. We prepare for that which could, in fact, come. And this parable, spoken by Jesus, is alluding to that reality. In this life, the visible church, the visible church, as in all of those who confess that they are Christian people, there are those who are preparing and there are those who are not preparing. That is the visible church. That is what Jesus is referencing here. Remember, all of those people wanted to see the bridegroom. They all wanted to greet him. Yet there were those who were ready to greet him and there were those who were not ready to greet him. There were those who had prepared and there were those who had not prepared. So the question for us as Christian people, as biblically founded Christian people, is what will we do to be prepared? And as I alluded to earlier, we must, at the very foundation, we must have faith as our foundation. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, a verse that is so foundational to who we are as Christian people. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. We confess this to be true. We confess that it is faith in Christ that justifies us before God and nothing else, nothing that we bring to the table, not our own efforts, not our own filling up of our oil flask. It is what Jesus Christ has done. 
Yet we must prepare as Christian people for what lies ahead. I am neither a prophet nor a son of a prophet, as the the words in Scripture often say. I don't know what's around the corner. I don't know what's coming next week. I don't know what's coming next year. I don't know. I do not have a vision into the future. That is not my calling as a pastor to, to receive a vision from God and give it to the people in my congregation. The task of a pastor is to simply proclaim the word that God has penned through the power of his Holy Spirit. And he calls us to prepare. He calls us to be ready. He calls us to have a oil flask ready to go. I don't know what is around the corner. Over these past few weeks, I'm sure there have been many people thinking, what is around the corner? What is going to happen now? We've, we've seen this divisive season, this pandemic combination of election, combination of all sorts of different things being played out, and, and we have kind of some answers now. So what is going to happen? No one really knows, but that does not change the task of the church. It does not change what we are to be about. It does not change anything. We are to continue to proclaim the word of God. We are continue to offer prayers for those who are in authority over us, but as for all people, that all people might confess Christ as Lord and Savior. So what will we be about? Will we be okay to be pushed against as far as preaching the word of God? No, we will continue to proclaim that which has been revealed by God himself. We will continue to proclaim that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father in heaven, that apart from him no man can be saved. We will continue to proclaim both law and gospel. We will continue to trust that he has us in his hands. But we continue to prepare. To prepare is to read the word of God. To prepare is to hear the word of God preached. To prepare is to inwardly digest God's word. To prepare is to actually do God's word. To prepare is to gather with those who share your confession of faith. To prepare is to live with these things within your families. To prepare is to eat and drink the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To prepare is to pray. To prepare is to continue to trust in Jesus for all that we have. That is how the flasks are filled. Because we are prepared, no matter how dark it may ever get, we will always have that oil to burn. That the light will shine brightly, and as the bridegroom comes, the trumpet blows, we will stand as shining lights in the darkness. As I've said, preparing is hard work. Preparing means to divert effort from certain areas of your life, to divert resources from certain areas of your life into areas that do not necessarily have immediate returns. That's a hard thing for humanity to do. It means being focused on prayer, both individually and corporate. It means to be focused on hearing God's Word, reading God's Word, studying God's Word, as I said before. And it means focused on intentional efforts of applying God's Word to your life in struggles, in trials, in temptations, or in anything else that has thrown your way. This is the idea of the life of a Christian, to pray, to meditate on God's Word, to study God's Word, and to live through trials and temptations all in accordance with God's word. I couldn't, uh, or I didn't uh, have the quote in front of me, and so it's from the back of my dusty old mind. But Luther said, 
something along the lines of, you can call me on it if I'm, if I'm wrong. If you find it, I'd be glad to, to write it down and correct myself. But Luther talked about how Satan actually makes the best theologian and the best Christians. Not because of what he has done. He doesn't get credit for doing that. But when Satan begins to press against you, it has the tendency to do one of two things. Pressure either makes you stronger or it breaks you. And for the Christian, when we are pressured by the world around us, when we are pressured by temptation, and it drives us to prayer, it drives us to God's Word, we are actually going to be strengthened through those trials and tribulations and the temptations itself. We do not have to rejoice in those things, but where it drives us is vitally important, and it will actually prepare the church to continue to stand and proclaim the Word of God. So we trust. We trust that God will not leave us to our own devices. We trust that He will provide all that we need. We trust that He is in control. But brothers and sisters, just because God is in control does not mean things will not ever be difficult. Sometimes the mistake of the, the, the phrase, God is in control, it brings us to a place where, okay, God is in control. If I just trust hard enough, then everything's going to go okay. That's not what God being in control means. God being in control means that no matter what you are going through, at the very end, we know that his promises are true. It does not mean that we will not have to live through very difficult things. Just ask the apostles. They would have confessed that God was in control. They would have time and time said that God has us close to him, yet they faced persecution, they faced jail, they faced all sorts of different things for proclaiming the gospel in their context. Yet they would never have wavered from the confession that God is in control. So as you go about your days, as you go about your life, do so in the mode of preparing. Preparing that our Savior is returning. Be about what He is about. Pray. Meditate on His Word. Study His Word. And trust it in the midst of trials and temptations. In this, we prepare for His return. In this, we will be ready to shine brightly in the midst of darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time.